This is everybody's day. This is everybody's day. Whosoever counsel that I just revealed about God who is robust in desire to both bless and to enable is beyond his man. God also is seeking for an avenue to bring the world at large and the rest of the community of believers into the reality of his blessings and his enablement. So the man who is gifted by God, truth, four things called two things. In grace, he was an embodiment of God's unmerited favor. In grace, it was also an embodiment of God's supernatural ability. In truth, he was an embodiment of the principles of God. In truth, he was an embodiment of the reality of God. That was God's total investment in Christ. But you find out that with all of God, Jesus did not and if you do a study to find out what the destiny of a disciple is, a disciple does not end his sojourn with his master with mental knowledge. The destiny of a disciple is built into the reality called rep. What it meant was that when Jesus checked out, each of the disciples was supposed to have been possessed or should have possessed those four streams from God. They will be embodiments of God's unmerited favor, of God's supernatural ability, of God's principles, and God's reality. So that Jesus could truly say that as the Father has sent me, not just in mission, but in equipping, so send I you. And that mandate was designed to be experienced in transgenerational fashion. You are blessed. Well, I'm not praying. I'm not praying. I'm just telling you that you are blessed. Paul's testimony concerning the fulfillment of this intention of God is that you have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. The blessing is summarily an enablement that makes for the fulfillment of of the original intent of a thing's creation. So God has looked into his purpose for your life and according to the testimony of scriptures, you have been fully equipped for it. Are you with me? Many times we act like he's just going to. You have been blessed. For God by his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So you have it. Everything that destiny demands, you have. But your degree of appropriation, according to scriptures, is through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. So as you increase in knowledge, you lay hold of what is available. Increasing knowledge does not make available. It just exposes to lay hold on what is already available. So that in some of those questions, some of the things you're asking, um, you know, people get to talk to me every day. Pray for us, pray for us. These days, I don't even pray for pray again. I was in the studio and I met one of my friends there this morning. So he said he had sent me a message before. And I can't remember. So when he now hired me again, and I went and saw the message. And my heart is cutting. I'm saying this publicly so that he's hearing me. Um, he had some visions and wanted me to, some visions from God that wanted me to bring instructions as to what to do. So I asked him a question. I said, um, when you started this journey of sights, and hearing, did he start with a man? He said, no. But he needs my input on certain things. My principle in seeking counsel is that if I have a problem, I always ask God. Meanwhile, I know that God has people. Are you with me? It will be God who directs me to who I will talk to. Because like you said to us, a man can be good 
but you can be a wrong counselor. So I told him, if he started with God, don't end with man. Go back to God. The time spent to unlock that answer in God will not be wasted. If it will become wasted time, God will point you in the direction of somebody who has a ready-made answer for you. However, I found out that the time spent in unraveling that mystery is a gift to God because God deals with more things than your answers in that period. As you stay long asking him, Lord, speak to me, Lord, speak to me, Lord, speak to me. He will speak to you, but there are more things that he's doing. He's fashioning a vessel. And you can abort that process if you jump out and take a ready-made answer. So if he does not instruct that you seek outside him, you stay. One of the core visions upon which our ministry is built was revealed on the 7th of November 2004. And it was unveiled for reality on the 11th of July, on the 6th of July 2011. So, it was permanently on as a prayer point. You showed me something. You showed me something. You showed me something. You showed me something. After like three years, I tried to seek counsel with one of my friends. And in trying to interpret, what he did was to bring out a dictionary. One of the words there was custodian. I was just back from school, Suez. And... Um, I saw that I was back on campus. It was like a trance. And then I beheld falling down from the sky. They look like Easter eggs. You know what Easter eggs are? It's like a normal egg, but it's bigger. And it's, it's artificial, so it's just locked. And then you can put maybe cookies or, or sweets most times inside them. I was in that experience with a very close friend. And I told them, if this thing is falling from heaven, I think that it should be useful for us. But he said he was not interested. So one was falling across his head and then he dragged me and I picked it and I heard a voice and the voice said, swallow it. Immediately it landed on my hand. The shape changed from egg. It became like a church with a spire. You know those old churches with towers and then a cross over it. That's what it became. And the voice did not say, eat it. You know, if you eat it, you just eat it like, um, like a drumstick. You chew some parts of He said, swallow it. And so I swallowed it. When I came back to myself in my room, my throat knew that something passed through it. Immediately it was swallowed, a voice said, today, I establish you in progression as one of the custodians of my church. So after three years of asking, what does it mean? And I went to this, my friend. The first person I went to, he gave me a sack of salmons. I should go and listen to it. I didn't find my answer. The second person said, eh, should be custodian is an English word. Let's go and find the meaning. So we went to the dictionary and we found out that a custodian was one who though could not claim ownership of was saddled with the responsibility of preserving and maintaining the sanctity of a thing. So some of the things we say are built into that thing. Are you with me? But you see, the dictionary has no powers to impart into that reality. So even though we understood from the dictionary, the runoff was impossible. Because on the 6th of July, 2011, I was on a prayer walk and I saw the same thing not happen physically. I was the only one that stood and saw things falling and saw things falling. He now revealed to me that a time will come when it will be in rapid fashion that churches will drop out of the economy of the grace of God. And that the responsibility will be to journey around. That's where my own itinerant ministry is sourced from. To journey around and strengthen the faith, strengthen the faith, strengthen the faith, strengthen the faith. There are realities that you will not enter into because you imparted. You will need to journey into them. So that in the day that God invites you to journey, He, you allow Him. Because many times, 
The gift is not hidden. The journey of unlocking is what brings preservation. You will lose things on that journey. You will gain things that will give to a balance when the gift becomes operational. Are you with me? Okay. Let me go into my labor. I just tried to add to what my God just uh, said there. All right. So, we have established that God blesses and that he loves to equip his people. And that he equips his people not as an end, but as a means so that the whole world can come into the experience of his blessedness and the whole world, as they align with him, can also be equipped for onward expression of what they have found. So Jesus gathered these 12 disciples together and... um, as he told out the 13th chapter of the book of John, he began to implicate their hearts with the consciousness of his departure. I've skipped a lot of verses, but in the 14th verse, he brings some basic instruction that I think we will need. Uh, let's do 15 instead, so that we don't stay too long. 15, 15, 14, 14 15. Think. If ye love me, keep my commandments. The man who will possess the Holy Ghost with attendant expression of the gifts of the same spirit must exist as a lover. Of the Christ. A lover of the Christ. You love him. You love his things. You love his mission. You have a greater than fan expression with Jesus. You are connected to his very heart. You know when his heart bleeds. You know when he has moved to get something done. You are permanently in sync with him. I mean that you have an emotional relationship with the Lord like a man will have with a woman. You are obsessed with bringing him pleasure. That's what love means to me. You can buy me the whole world. If you don't think that pleasing me is utmost, then I don't count things as love. I don't have a track record of enjoyment. And so I don't have a handle on things. You know, if you have enjoyed, they can turn to you with things. Somebody was inviting me to a, mini, to a meeting recently. Five hours. Five hours. Four and a half hours. About five ministers and five ministers to preach. And I said, sir, how would we preach? The five of us in four and a half hours. And then there's another five individuals who will sing. You know people like those? I don't know if they do it around here. It can be 12 mistresses, 12 preachers, and the meeting is a four-hour meeting. Meanwhile, well, if you do that kind of meeting, God will help you. The ministers don't even talk to themselves. So every man comes and takes a scattered part for their sessions, so you speak for 20 minutes, speak for 20 minutes, because the song must be more than the preaching. So I now told him I was not interested. That I don't do that kind of ministry again. He now said, ah, we have a robust welfare package for you. And I laughed. And I'll translate what I said in Yoruba. I said, you don't scare a man who has not known enjoyment with things. You know, if you used to eat, what are the good things people buy here? Okay, there's shawarma here. Okay, do you have pizza here? Oh, no. See, they are in, are are they Adulam students? (laughs) Honestly, back at home, we thought that all of you were fasting. Okay, okay. So let's use shawarma, even though shawarma is not a big thing. It's, it's more profitable to eat for food than to eat shawarma. May God give you understanding. Uh, 
So I just liberated the brothers there. Now, now, now. If you had not lived around Shama, and then somebody says, if you don't do this thing, will not give you Shama, would you move? There's no appetite for it. That's how I got myself away. Why did I do that? You would think it was arrogance. It was an act of love for Jesus. Because I know that what the man was trying to do was to motivate me. It's another God I'll be serving. The excellence of speech, the excellence of manifestations will be to, you will think it's Jesus. You will not know that it's the package that got me into the team. That's how subtle a man can be led away because they know that you have a gift. Sometimes the gift, because I said in the morning that the gifts, the nine gifts are not exhaustive. God by his spirit elevates a man into a place where you have influence. And sometimes your face on the flyer can bring people to a meeting. And so it's possible that people begin to merchandise your face. And you must know when to say enough is enough because the Lord is not pleased. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's why we also need to press into the tools of perception because you cannot obey commandments where you cannot perceive them. Are you with me? An additional thing that you will ask for when the gifts become operational are the tools of perception. You will be weak in the administration of the gifts if you cannot hear him, if you cannot see him. Remember, a good number of the gifts are deployed by utterance. Are you with me? It means that if you cannot hear what he's saying, you will speak wrongly. For Jesus said that my, the words that I speak are not my own. As I hear, I speak. Some of the gifts border on acts of power. Jesus also said, the son can by his own do nothing. So that the son does only what he seeth the father do. It means if you are blind to divine activity, the abuse of your gifting is inevitable. So that's another area that we must press into. But why did I come here? The next verse is what I really need. Jesus said, and, and and means that what I'm introducing is premised on what I first said. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. In some translations, what you see there is helper. That he may abide with you forever. This Asking is not to furnish the believer with the foundational reception of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? He's not saying that if you love me, you obey my commandments because that is not an entrance requirement into the economy of God. Do you tell somebody who does not have the Christ in him to love the Christ and obey his commandments? No, it means that person has no capacity to love him nor to advertise his love for Jesus by obeying his commandments. The love of God that compels us is also a furnishing. And according to scriptures, it is shared abroad in our hearts by... It means if he's not there, you can't love him. So what Jesus is advertising here... Is not actually the first entrance of the Holy Spirit into that mystical union with your human spirit. He is referring to what happened in Acts chapter 2, which was the release of the distributions of power that we call the gifts of the Spirit. Make me pressure the Father. What will make me ask the Father to give to you is that you have demonstrated devotion to me by obeying my commandments. It means that even though you have the presence of the Spirit, 
The workings of the giftings of the Spirit are not by design supposed to be effectual in the disobedient. Disobedient. 